It is now my honor to welcome back to the podium past President Carl Eggy to introduce our long speaker for today. Please join me in welcoming to the podium an outstanding lawyer, jurist, and community leader, United States District Judge Richard A. Jones. Thank you, and it's indeed a pleasure and opportunity that I've looked forward to spending a little bit of time with you this afternoon. But before I get started, first I have to let you know that I just spent the last two days teaching judges at the National Judicial College, and it's a much more easygoing crowd today than looking at 100 plus judges looking at you for two full days. That's always a tough challenge. But I also want to thank Seattle Rotary because actually it was here in 1994 that I actually started my campaign as a judge. And I walked around this room with John Bridge, who's in the front row today. And he introduced me to several of the business leaders in this community to let them know that I was an OK person to be a judge. <laughs> so I appreciate that, John. I appreciate you, Carl, for you and the invitation for being here today. And my first order of business is to really extend a congratulations to the winners for life. This is a huge accomplishment, and you deserve every single bit of praise. And I also have to tell you that the Seattle Rotary hasn't given an official sanction for this, but I know that you've been feeling so much love today and so much positive feeling that your head's probably got to be this big right now. And as an extra bonus and benefit, the Seattle Rotary is going to provide a limo service back home with the dome to get your head in and get you back home. <laughs> I also wish to pay special tribute to the Rotarians for your recognition of the important accomplishments of each of these students. You never know what will come from the opportunities that you create with this recognition. You have no idea what these students will accomplish or how this recognition will elevate them to prove to you and many others that today's recognition is well, well deserved. Let me just say that I have a bit of experience in the I'm going to prove myself category of life. To illustrate my point, I want to take you back to December 18, 2003, to the largest of courtrooms in King County Superior Court, located on the ninth floor, the presiding department. This was the day that Gary Leon Ridgeway a man considered by many to be the most prolific killer, the most prolific serial killer in the history of the United States. He was going to be sentenced. Also known as the Green River Murder, Ridgway had been responsible for murdering 48 women, and speculation that had it that he was responsible for many, many more deaths. And depending upon whose book that you read or count that you hear about, the number of deaths may have been as high as 90. Let me paint for you what that morning looked like for myself. This case was originally assigned to me on March 25, 2002. Now to save you from having to do the math in your head, I had the case for approximately 22 months. And 22 months of my life was consumed with wrestling with the vast number of issues and challenges that this assignment presented. I lived and breathed Mr. Ridgway for 22 months. Now in the courtroom on this cold wintry morning, approximately 30 seats had been reserved just for media representatives who were cramming the jury box and had been specially modified just to accommodate their numbers. And they were the lucky ones who had obtained their positions by lottery. The throngs of other media were in a capacity filled room on another floor where the media could blog, text, report, tweet, and pontificate on what would occur that morning. Now in chambers, a host of satellites pointing to the towers of Queen Anne where they were feeding broadcasts nationally and the internationally known networks around the planet. The presiding department courtroom was filled to capacity with standing room only. The doors to the courthouse opened very early that morning to accommodate the more than 300 family members friends, and those connected with the victims of Mr. Ridgway, 
In fact, the presiding judge that morning asked for all the other courtrooms to shut down, not have any court that morning for one reason, so that the courts could focus and concentrate just on this one case. Now, many of these family members were waiting anxiously to confront the killer of their loved ones after having waited for years for this opportunity, and some for as many as 20 years. Many of these people were filled with rage, anger, and outrage, others forgiveness, but no one knew exactly how they would act or respond to the circumstances. The numerous guards were positioned in this courthouse and in specific and strategic locations to say, let's call it temporarily relocate those who would be suspected, we suspected, might yield to their emotions by acting out in the courtroom. Keller made absolutely no difference that day. Mr. Ridgeway's victims were multicultural, white, black, Native American, Asian. Pain was pain, and it bore no color. Also in this courtroom and surrounding the building, in the stairwells and the halls, were scores of law enforcement officers whose assignment was to provide security and crowd control. I myself had been with two personal guards most of the morning as security as against anyone hoping to try and prevent my appearance that day and blocking the proceedings from going forward. When it came time to leave my chambers on the seventh floor, the officers and I walked to the stairwell to begin the climb to the ninth floor. Under the circumstances, the elevators were clearly off limits to us. I was shocked when I went to the stairwell door and opened it, thinking it was going to be empty, but to my surprise, I looked and shoulder to shoulder on the floors going down and shoulder to shoulder going up the stairs, well past the ninth floor, were law enforcement officers. As we started up the stairs, one of the officers I recognized started to salute me. And then a chain reaction followed, and every other officer, as I climbed the stairs, started to do the exact same gesture. This was a humbling experience, but it was a clear reminder to me of the enormity of what was about to unfold and respect for the challenge I was about to face. The sentencing was scheduled to begin promptly at 9 a.m. At about 8.55 that morning, the five lawyers representing the prosecuting attorney's office, the seven lawyers representing Mr. Ridgway, were escorted by guard to their seats at the front of the courthouse. Mr. Ridgway was the last to arrive, wearing a red jumpsuit and sweatshirt trying to cover the bulletproof vest he was wearing. He as well was surrounded by what appeared to be a small army of officers fearful that someone would try to harm him or his lawyers. This would be a long day filled with deep emotions, sorrow, and pain. Now when this case was first assigned to me, the presiding judge, Richard Eady, called and asked for a visit. We both knew why he wanted to talk to me as speculation was rampant around the courthouse of where this case would ultimately land. And this was not a random selection process. After he entered, the conversation was extremely short. He stated that unless I had plans to retire in the next two to three years, and these are his words, and short of a presidential appointment to the federal bench, <laughs> the case would be assigned to me. His last remark before leaving, Richard, this case is of the magnitude where the entire world will focus upon King County. You will represent us, and I know you will do well. He closed the doors, and the next 22 months, Ridgeway and I dealt. At the time of the assignment, I had no idea the demands of the case or the strain upon every emotion, leadership, organization, and legal skill that I possessed. At this final day, as it approached, I had logged countless hours meeting with various law enforcement organizations, coordinating security, wrestling with the demands of broadcast and print media, facilities, court administration, counsel, the safety of Ridgeway, and on top of this, the multitude of inquiries from every single person I knew about what was going on just about every single day. By 8.58 that morning, everyone was seated in an eerie, Silence and dead calm took over the entire courtroom. The anxiety of every person in that room in the courthouse and around the city was rising. 
And news reports the following day reflected that the city stopped at the stroke of 9 a.m. to listen and watch the final chapter of Mr. Ridgway's 20-year reign of terror come to a conclusion. As the clock ticked closer to 9 o'clock, I gathered my staff, and we all took hands, and I said a brief and quiet prayer to myself and to my staff and thanked them for all that they had endured the last several months. And within moments, my bailiff knocked on the door and said, Judge, they're ready for you. It is 9 o'clock exactly. So to the winners of life, you're probably saying to yourselves, that's awfully heavy to be talking about on the day of my celebration. <laughs> and you are absolutely right. And you are also saying, well, what does Mr. Ridgway have to do with me? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> but the dots connect when you consider my background, my history, and the high improbability that I would grow up from being a raggedy little kid in the Central District to handling a case of this magnitude. So winners for life, you and I do have something in common. The ability to beat the odds and significant personal challenges and succeed. Now in high school, I too faced a host of challenges, but I never imagined in my wildest dreams that I'd one day become a judge or be on center stage responsible for handling one of the most, if not the most, significant criminal case in the history of our state. With that, and with what I've learned about you, I can honestly say that every single one of you has a potential to find yourselves exactly in the same type of position of tremendous responsibility and leadership, just the same as I have done. It's not magic. It just requires commitment and dedication and something that you really want to do. But let's be real, you're probably saying, I could never do that. And there's a phrase you probably heard quite a few bit the last few years, yes, you can. You have the ability to achieve and do things beyond your wildest imaginations. Now, was I nervous that day? You bet. As the hours the night before clicked away, was I fearful or have bouts of self-doubt about my ability to handle the challenge? Absolutely. Sometimes that comes along with the business of the profession that you choose. The thoughts creep into my mind of how others might criticize how I will handle this event. No question. Particularly since I knew that every gesture and every word that came out of my mouth would be broadcast across the planet. But I felt right then that everything I had done as a lawyer, a judge, and that I learned in life, especially how to deal with other people, had prepared me for that moment. Now, my first tip of the day to you is that today is your special day, and you should be extremely proud. But you have to believe that your recognition today will not be the highlight of your life. If it is, then I want all of you to line up right now, and I want you to give me your plaques. And I'm going to take those plaques away from you, and I will personally play, pay for them to be re-inscribed to read winner for the day. <laughs> I don't see a rush to the lectern, so I'm assuming that that's a safe bet. Today will not be your last day of success or recognition. It's just the beginning of a long step, a long journey of really being a winner for life. You have to believe this and tell yourself this is so every single day, no matter what the challenge. Our message to each of you is to fuel your dreams with positive images of who you are and what you want to be and you have the capacity to become. And how do I know? Because if I hadn't believed at a young age that I could be a winner for life, that was before they invented that concept, I'd have spent many days and many hours on the other side of the bench, wearing a red jumpsuit, probably pleading not guilty. So let me share just a wee bit of my background. I was the last of eight children growing up in a two-bedroom house in the Central District in Seattle, around the corner from Garfield High School a location that real estate officials describe as poor and blue collar. Now, if you care to visit our family home, it's still there, 410 22nd Avenue, like I said, around the corner from Garfield High School, and more noteworthy, Ezel's Chicken. <laughs> Not trying to put a plug in for anybody, that just happens to be a landmark. My father was a carpenter, my mother was a maid, and I was the first to graduate from college in our family. 
In our neighborhood, the Street of Dreams did not include a view of designer homes on display in the luxurious hills of the east side, but rather a small window on the upstairs that looked over a vacant lot filled with blackberry bushes and garbage. But the vision that I had took me to different worlds full of opportunity and dreams every single time I looked out. Well, many of the kids on my block went on to have successful lives as winners for life, as iron workers, painters, and teachers. Some of the kids in my block went on to become, unfortunately, losers for life. And they became severely addicted to drugs and alcohol, and some even overdosed and died in their teens. In fact, my next door neighbor, who I thought was the most famous person because they were the first person I knew to be in the newspaper, because she had been convicted of multiple counts of bank robbery and sentenced to prison. I still have a small scar on my eyebrow from changing her tall, lanky brother up the concrete stairs that joined her homes. Oh, and by the way, he was also convicted of robbery because he wanted to get in to help his sister because she was making too much money and he wanted to share in the proceeds. Unfortunately, when she decided to let him help, that's when she got caught. And one of my running mates as a child, they lived just down the street on Terrace. Their brother went to prison for murder that he committed during the course of a robbery. These are but a few of the examples of how I grew up and where I grew up. And trust me, I did not grow up in Mr. Robinson's neighborhood. Now, with this background and other experiences, I had been predicted to fail, frequently counseled by teachers to abandon a college education. And I was encouraged to pursue a trade and labor. I was repeatedly taunted with statements that pursuing a law degree and practicing law was an unrealistic goal, a pipe dream, a fairy tale that would never, ever, ever come true. I had a whole different reality of what grim fairy tales really meant. But I chose not to heed the advice of these people who I now consider to be idiots. Now, before we go get carried away, I don't want the students to go out and start calling people to give you negative advice, idiots. And I don't want to sound arrogant or unkind in calling someone an idiot. But negative counseling and advice with the goal of killing a person's dream is sheer idiocy. And I learned long ago not to argue with an idiot because they will bring you to their level and beat you with experience. The ultimate is to prove them wrong, and that is my message to anyone who tells you that you can't be a winner for life. So all of those who tell you that you can't, including all the haters, and the young folks know what I'm talking about, prove them wrong. If you go back to my high school annual, it has a statement about what my goal in life was. Everybody else talked about to meet the nirvana, whatever it was. But mine reads, to prove myself. That's exactly what it says in my high school annual. Why? Because then and on many other occasions, I just couldn't see myself having a successful career in any particular field. In retrospect, I may have even enabled some of my past critics with a basis to challenge my goals. I wasn't an honor student in high school, college, or law school. On paper, I appeared to be just an average student. I could give you a thousand different reasons right now, but the one thing I did know how to do that was to work hard, work smart, and understand people. I was determined to prove that a hardworking, average student could succeed and surpass the academic achievements of many of the perceived superstars and those who came from wealth beyond my imagination. My, now, many of you are probably looking up and thinking that I have it made because I'm a federal judge. Well, I won't disagree, for starters. But I want you to know that every job that I've ever had and every level of success and every level of success that every one of you winners for life will face, it will come with the price and it will come with the challenge, with sometimes people putting roadblocks in the pathways to your dreams. But in every step of your dream, never be afraid to dream or to take risk as you face what at the time may seem to be like an insurmountable obstacle. When you read my resume or listen to the summary of my background, it sounds like I was just whistling Dixley and just skipping through life and everything was fine and pleasant. This is far from the truth. Every aspect of every education I've held, I had to work. High school, and matter of fact, in law school, I had two jobs. 
one working in inner city program as a part-time bookkeeper and also working at the United States Attorney's Office as a law clerk. And somehow I managed to strike a balance between little sleep, work, and study. And you may have to do the exact same thing or even face tougher obstacles if college or your profession is really your goal. I'll also tell you that you will have some major setbacks that will really test you if you're committed to your goal of being a winner for life. In fact, some of these challenges are going to seem like Mike Tyson just pops you in the mouth and knocks you on the ground. One of my first challenges occurred shortly before graduation from law school. I was approached by one of the largest law firms downtown Seattle and asked to apply for an attorney position. As you can imagine, I was elated at that point in time. And after going through the interviews and what I thought was a strong performance, according to the hiring partner, I was advised my reference checks were glowing. So you knew I was starting to soar. And I received a call from a hiring partner, and we scheduled lunch at Rosalini's 410 downtown, if you can remember that. I was confident an offer would be made, and so was the, assistant, or the United States Attorney at that time. And for the folks that are my age and older, if you remember Stan Pitkin. As a matter of fact, Stan came in and patted me on the back where the law clerks hung out and said, Jones, I want you to know you're probably going to get an offer this afternoon. Congratulations. You've earned it. So I left my chest poking out and my wool suit. And by the way, it was 80 degrees outside, but it didn't make any difference. I was going to get a real job. But when we met, the partner told me he had recommended my hire. And before he could finish the sentence, he uttered that one word you never, ever, ever want to hear in an interview when you're being considered for employment. However, and the however was followed with the words, the senior partners have rejected my recommendation. They are concerned about the reaction our clients might have to working with the black lawyer. The partner closed our meeting with the words, please don't take this personal. <laughs> Not my words, his. And they finished with, I'm just trying to be honest with you, I think you'll be a good lawyer, just not with us, and not at this time. It would have been quite easy to give up upon my dream before I had a chance to begin and think about perhaps a different line of work, and maybe it wouldn't have the same obstacles and challenges or people thinking like that about things that I couldn't change. But for me, this challenge is like throwing jet fuel on a bonfire. This just inflamed my direction to once again prove myself with an even greater passion. I share this experience as an example of one of the many challenges I faced in the pursuit of my dream. No way was I going to let that slap of rejection and all that I'd worked for come to an end. I knew my backup plan to quitting included that formidable combination of imagination, determination, and resourcefulness to make my dream a reality. And you too must learn that these are necessary ingredients in the formula for your future success. But my challenge to each of you is to dream, but to dream big dreams. And let no person limit the extent or use or breadth of your imagination. But to make all of this happen, Seattle Rotarians, you need to understand that one of the most serious and explosive issues in the United States today is how to meet the educational needs of culturally and linguistically diverse students. I've heard dropout rates for certain groups in this city all over the planet. Scary, frightening numbers. I won't cite them because I know from our superintendent here that everybody misquotes the statistics and judges don't like to misquote statistics or so be wrong. But if the current trends in educational achievement continue, millions of students, primarily poor African American, Asian, Native American, and Hispanics, will not obtain the education necessary for full participation in the economic and civic life of our country. The inequality that results from differences in educational achievement of children is likely to make the social stability of the United States increasingly doubtful. While there's no standard strategy that exists to address these needs, the unique combination of what Seattle Rotary is doing today by honoring these students is a tremendous step in the right direction. But please know that a stepping stone without a pathway or clear direction has the potential to cause confusion and frustration for those taking that first step. These winners for life need mentors, a firm commitment to their success, and Lord have mercy, employment. I know for a fact that within the confines of this room are some of the brightest minds in the city. 
you have the power and the resources to take the next step with these winners for life and help them make their dreams a reality. Not just with today's celebration, but a commitment to make your theme of being a winner for, for life a reality so that one day they may sit at your table shoulder to shoulder as a fellow and sister Rotarian. So in closing, Joshua Hernandez, where are you? Please stand up. When you begin your degree from MIT, when you obtain your degree from MIT, I want you to make sure that you continue to use it as an advocate for health care and patient rights. And always know that the richness of your work will help others that you may never meet. And Deandra Deshay Glaspie, please stand. When you complete your degree, we know you will help create beautiful minds with your passion and work in the area of childhood psychology. And Florence Sue, please stand. Whether you become a pediatrician or a computer engineer, always remember to value the time of others and do quality work. And if all of the winners for life would please stand right now, because I've got a special message that's just for you. All of you, please stand. And I want you to remain standing, not to cause any undue attention to you, but I want to share a quote to you that comes from the book called The Secret. There's a particular passage in that book, it's, I believe it's on page 182, and it reads as follows, and this is my message to you. Every single thing that you've been through, every single moment that you've come through were to prepare you for this moment right now. Imagine what you can do from this day forward with what you know now. Now you get that you are the creator of your destiny. So how much more do you get to do? How much more do you get to be? How many more people do you get to bless simply by your mere existence? What will you do with this moment? How will you seize the moment? No one else can dance your dance. No one else can sing your song. No one else can write your story. Who you are. What you do begins right now. Good luck, and bless you, and congratulations. Thank you so much. Next week, July, I mean July, April 29th, I'm, I'm fine, I'm really fine. We will be at the new Hyatt at Olive 8. We'll be focusing on transportation. Our short segment will be Paul Tosh, Como News, Eye in the Sky, um, traffic reporter, and our long program will be given by Paula Hamilton, um, Hammond, the Washington State, State Secretary of Transportation. Thanks today to all of you who participated in the program. Patrick, we appreciate your hard work in coordinating this very important event. And Judge Jones, thank you for joining us. Your words are inspirational. We appreciate them. Thank you. But a special thanks goes to our honorees. You are amazing, and we are so proud of you. As, as our leaders in the future, we know that we are in good hands. Each of you has overcome challenges, and each of you has succeeded. These struggles were hard. Today, bask in the warmth of the achievement. Not only do you deserve the glory, but you need to savor the moment, not just because it feels good, but also because the success of today will spur you to higher places tomorrow. This will not be your last major life challenge. But whatever you pay, face, you know now that you can be successful. It's like working out in the gym. It's hard work. It's heavy lifting. But with each repetition, it gets easier and you get stronger. But before you leave today, look around the room. Remember the faces. We believe in you. We expect great things from you. And we are with you on that journey. At Rotary, 
we are all business people and we all have business cards. Be sure you collect them today. Hang on to them. We would be delighted to hear from you and also support and encourage you. Business cards can be very important. At a birthday party for one of our members, amidst the jokes and laughter, a young woman asked for the microphone. She told the story of being on an airplane. International complications had forced her to leave school. Discouraged and disappointed, she was heading back to home to a life she had worked so hard to improve. Politely, the man next to her introduced himself, and they began to chat. Grateful for a compassionate ear, this young woman poured out her story. She didn't know where she was going. She didn't know what she was going to do. Her life was simply overwhelming. As they left the airport, this Rotarian gave her his business card and said, if there's ever anything I can do, please give me a call. These may sound like superficial words. And in fact, the young lady just tucked that business card in her pocket and headed back to remake her life. Months later, life was going well. It looked like she was going back to school. Her dream was once again on track. But then, as so often happens, bang, a roadblock, an insurmountable problem. Overwhelmed by discouragement, Medina walked away. She thrust her hand in the pocket of her coat where she found that business card. If ever there was a time for help, it was now. So she called. He answered. The problems were handled. Medina came back to school. She graduated from college. Her dream came true. Medina will always be grateful for that business card, but she will always be especially grateful to Chris Clark. Today, Medina is not only is not alone in the pride she feels in her accomplishments. I don't think there's anyone prouder than Chris Clark. So as you leave today, make sure you have fistfuls of these business cards. <laughs> and just don't call us if you have a problem. We want to hear from you along the way. We want to be a part of your philosophical debates. We want to listen as you decide the forks in your road's journey. We want to celebrate your successes. Know always that we are here to lend a hand. We believe in you. Please stay in touch. We are adjourned. Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from First Choice Health, working with the Washington Health Information Collaborative to use technology to bring better health care to patients throughout the Pacific Northwest. First Choice Health.